everybody. My co-host Hazuri and I have an incredible guest for you today, and we're honored to have him join us today to talk about Gen Z youth activism and being a teen entrepreneur. Jank Oz is the founder of the social enterprise Thread Media, a publishing, consulting, media, and production company focused on social change news and insights aimed at teenagers and young adults. His work has reached Generation Z across the globe, and young people from over 140 countries have visited Thread.com. He's also partnered with more than 10 large social change organizations, including Global Citizen. Jenk began his journey at the age of eight. Yes, eight. And he continues to take every opportunity to support and promote positive social change, both online and offline. And in 2021, he was named to the Diana Award Roll of Honor. And yes, you heard correctly. He is a teen. Welcome to being me, Jenk. Is there anything else that you'd like to let our listeners know about you or about the things that you're working on? We'd love to hear it. Thank you very much for the very kind introduction. I hope I can live up to uh, the high standards set there. I'm joined by the wonderful Sophia, who's next to me, who I'm going to let introduce herself. Hi, yes, I'm a senior writer and a specialist editor here at Thread. I actually also focus on work that partners with our Gen Zers across the globe through exclusive articles and live interviews that tell the inspiring work that they're doing to make the world a better place. Amazing, Sophia. So happy to have you joining us today as well. Well, there's clearly a lot to talk about, so let's talk. We usually start our interviews by asking our guests to share a little bit about what they were like as teens. So, Jenk, since you're still a teen, we wanted to ask you a little bit about your passion for being a DJ. How did you get started with that? And what is it about being a DJ that appeals to you? Well, a weird kind of story. As much as I like to tell her she's not very cool, my mum was actually a DJ. And I think that's where that kind of came from. When I was around 12 years old, I think I got like the little mini decks and I started downloading music and sort of kind of playing music, trying to learn how to mix. And then after a couple of years, we got the big decks, the big boys, which now sit downstairs and we hook them up to an obnoxiously loud speaker system. And I kind of, that's what I do on my Saturday nights now. I just really, really enjoy it. I think it's quite good fun. And I love music in general. And I find that the music that I enjoy listening to, I can now basically make, which I think is probably where the amusement comes from. It. That's so cool. Yeah, that's Thank really you. awesome. Sophia, can you tell us a little bit about what you were like as a teen? As a teenager, I don't really have much to say, if I'm being honest. I definitely was very focused on kind of figuring out who I was and what I was interested in, which at the time seemed to be languages and traveling. That kind of was my passion as a child, and it's definitely followed me into my life today. And yeah, I just love meeting people. That's probably my favorite thing to do in 2022. I love that. I'm so happy that we're getting to speak with both of you. Jenk, you started your first startup, iCool Kid, when you were only eight years old and you were named the youngest CEO in Britain. I have to ask, what was that experience like to be at the center of so much media attention at such a young age, coupled again with the responsibility of being part of such a high profile media startup? I don't think it really ever sunk in or worse. And to be honest, I don't think it has quite yet, to be honest. It was very kind of surreal and weird, and it almost felt like, not normal in the sense, but it it was weird. Like, I didn't feel like I was someone special or famous. I just felt like I was me, and I was kind of developing this idea that I had, and it just so happened to be through a kind of a website. And it felt kind of weird seeing people write about me and seeing there was interest in what I was doing. To be honest, I still think it's quite weird that people take interest in what I do. I think it's, it's it's quite surreal. It's You're an interesting guy. I've been with Jenk for about three years now, working alongside him. I've been there since the I Conquered days as well. And I mm. think he's underselling himself a little bit there. It was definitely <laughs> a very, very impressive venture for a, a boy of his age. It was definitely really emblematic of Gen Z as well. It was kind of the first foray into that sphere. Yeah, it was, it was really great to be able to experience that as well. I'm sure. Do you ever look back at things that you thought about or your perspective back then? now, present day, and wonder, oh my goodness, if I were going through that now, my perspective would be different or I'd be thinking about it differently. I'm just curious as to what that reflection has been like for you. I think just through the kind of the time that I've spent kind of around people, learning from people, kind of developing this idea, I've learned a huge amount. And But I also think there's much that I would do very differently. I think that at every moment where we've made a decision, I feel like that was the right decision at that moment. So there's nothing that I would particularly do differently. 
And I don't think that my idea would have gone hugely different if I had kind of gone about it in a different way. Because I, I think that the idea is really what drives it and the idea doesn't really change. That's but, so uh, fascinating to hear. It sounds like you really stayed true to what the idea was. And, and that was kind of the core of everything. Well, yeah, I, I really hope so. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> so that brings us to your current startup, Thread. Can you tell us where the name Thread came from and how you kind of came up with that? Can you also tell us a little bit about the mission of Thread? Yeah, sure. The name, I think, I think it's true as actually here when we had that little brainstorming section. I remember on like the whiteboard, we put lots of kind of small one syllable combinations of letters down. Something catchy. And yeah, something catchy. We thought Thread was really cool on like, quite a lot of points because well, the whole point of Thread initially was really to draw out a community of like-minded people to enact positive social change on a global scale. So the word thread really worked for that because it was almost like a thread of a community. It's like a thread of social change that runs through everything. So, I mean, if we could go on for ages incorporating the word thread into every sentence, which I think we do quite often. I but love that. <laughs> it, it, it kind of works after a while. We like it in short, kind of punchy, catchy, and it kind of encapsulates the community aspect of thread. Which, we're kind of moving on to the second point of your question, the goal with thread is Essentially, we realize that there needs to be change in the world. And I don't personally believe that one single person is going to make that change. But that change is going to come about where lots of people enact positive social change on a local scale. And when local change happens on a global scale, all of a sudden you have global change. So the idea of Thread is to inspire, impact, and motivate the most amount of people across the world to enact that local change. And we really hope that that is what we're, we're doing. Well, that's the goal, at least. I want to come back to something you just said about lots of people coming together to create that change. Because we know that Gen Z is a very social impact focused generation. And one of the top issues for them right now is climate change. And I knew that you've been very active in this space and you joined Dr. Jane Goodall on the stage at the COP26 Climate Summit in Scotland. Can you share with our audience about how they might also get involved in pushing the needle forward on climate change? With climate change, it works almost in the same way that I think all social change works. And we like to think of it as a six-step process almost. And there's a story about the six steps on thread somewhere kind of in the backlog now. But effectively... The first step is you lend your money in the sense that you buy with brands who you align with. You buy with brands who show the same moral compass and the same ideals and morals and kind of ethics almost that you want to associate yourself with. So I really like that. Yeah, it's like speaking with your wallet, if you're that term. <laughs> yeah, precisely, precisely. <laughs> and then we go from lending your wallet to lending your voice. And that's when you start talking on social media and encouraging your friends to learn about the issues. And you really start to spread the awareness and the passion. Then the next step above that would be letting your feet. So that's going to protests and going to volunteering and to signing up for various different programs or campaigns. And then the next step above that would be joining a campaign and then leading a campaign. And then finally, you have change at a governmental level. So just to sum that up, wallet, voice, feet, joining, leading, and then change at a governmental level. Did I get that right? Yeah. What advice do you have for any teens that want to be activists, whether it be on climate change or mental health or whatever different issues that they're passionate about? How do they get started on being an activist? Well, I think it's just that. I think it's inspiring and talking to as many like-minded people as possible. And then as you're doing that, you're going to gain people along the way. And I think that's one of the great things about social media is that it's always a feedback loop in the sense that you post, more people join the calls, they post, and then more people join the calls. And then all of a sudden, you've got a whole generation whose core culture is about changing the world for the better. That's so inspiring. And it's such a beautiful image to just picture all these people come together so quickly. But I think you're absolutely right in that this next generation is going to create our future and it has a lot of power and ability to do that. I wanted to ask, what issues and causes are you seeing the Thread community respond to beyond climate change? I mean, what seems to be top of mind for folks? If I may interject here, I think as a writer that's part of the team here, I think that our main focus is to just incorporate all facets of life yeah. and draw on them with a social change angle. So this is essentially the message that we're trying to get across is that everything can be social change if you want it to be. So fashion, technology, 
climate, everything is so, so deeply affected by the climate crisis. And we're trying to make people understand that if you view everything with a climate lens, then it will enable you to act and to feel connected to the cause. That's so important. I love that you added that. Can you speak more about what you just said about social change and technology? I think that's a really interesting intersection for this generation. Yeah, I mean, I think that social change and technology are intrinsically linked. In my personal opinion, I think the opinion of many, because technology itself has allowed us to, as Jake was talking about before, be so vocal about where we stand on these issues. And we can actually create communities and speak with people all over the world about our opinions and our goals and what we need to do as a society to bring about real, genuine change in the future that will protect our planet, ultimately. It's so true. It almost enables those conversations in a new way. I think it's also just worth adding quickly the kind of where the economy is going, 2030's economy, the jobs needed for 2030's economy. Firstly, 85% of them haven't been created at scale yet. By 2030's economy, 800 million jobs are going to be lost to AI and automation. But it's important to know that the jobs coming up are all in those two sectors of social change and technology, which I don't think is much of a surprise to people. But It's a big shift in what we're going to get trained for because I can't imagine that the local car mechanic is going to be the same car mechanic who's fixing the self-driving Teslas. It's going to be a huge huge shift necessary to get to 2030's economy. But the big shift is really going to come in those two exact sectors, the social change and the technology, Mm -hmm. which is why I think it's really important that we speak about that the most because that's where the attention is going to be. You're so right. That's such a great point. And I like how future oriented you are in just thinking about the world in 2030. I know I haven't done that in, in some time, maybe ever. So I so appreciate you bringing that up. Yeah, definitely. There's been a lot of talk both in the US and the UK about teens and social media. And a lot of the times when adults are talking about Gen Z and social media, there's a really negative bias around it. What are some ways that Gen Z can use social media and technology in a positive way and to make the world a better place. I think that a lot of the reason why we hear a lot of the stigma around social media is because it's a bit of a tip of the iceberg situation where 99% of it is good and we hear about the one bad percent because that's the one with the effects. I think one of the biggest downsides to social media, specifically around kind of thread and social change, it's a bit of a double-edged sword really because Yes, social media drives huge amounts of awareness and power of collectivism is unbelievably understated. But it also, for people who are Generation Z, could arguably be a very anxious generation. For people who suffer from kind of eco-anxiety, it has quite a negative effect because all we see on social media is the horrible things happening around the world and how much better the world needs to get. But in reality, you could argue that we're kind of 80% looking to get to 100%. Whereas the way the social media portrays the world is like that we're 10% and we need to get to 100%. So that causes quite a lot of people to have quite kind of bad eco-anxiety around kind of the state of the world. I think it's also about finding a balance. I think there's a a real positive about social media and its ability to, as we've talked about, enable these conversations. But it's also about making sure that you are allowing yourself time away from it. As you mentioned, Jake, just now, the amount of information that young people are privy to in 2022 is absolutely insurmountable. We cannot even fathom what it's doing to our minds. And it is really anxiety inducing it. It can be really difficult to constantly be in tune to what's going on in the world, whether it be good or bad. So it's just about making sure that we are giving ourselves a break from it while staying involved. I love that idea of both giving yourself a break and also staying involved. I'm curious, a question for both of you. Do you have any recommendations for how teens might think about using social media to get involved, not only to share their voice, but then also just use social media in a positive way that leaves them just generally feeling better instead of worse? So for me personally, it's been a long time in the making, but I have kind of curated my social media feeds to be about the things that I'm passionate about. I think As I just said, there's so much information out there and it can be super overwhelming at times. So if we just choose a single topic that we want to be actively involved in and to have that come up on us, that can be really great. But it's about not allowing ourselves to get really sucked into it. And we can do that by limiting screen time is kind of the go-to that I do on a daily basis to protect my mental health and just to make sure that I am allowing myself a real mental shutdown from these things. I don't know, do you have any advice? 
Well, I think just a kind of all the question, although I am definitely not advocating for running away from the problem, I think that there are a lot of social media platforms <laughs> which are less used, but really, really kind of don't have the same kind of kind of anxiety inducing effects. These digital kind of campfires, places like Discord, Geneva, Reddit, especially, are places where, and the way I like to think about it is, Twitter and Instagram and Facebook, you follow one person who talks about everything. And the idea, the focus is the person who's talking. Whereas on Reddit and Discord and Geneva and IRL now, and even Clubhouse, the focus isn't the person, the focus is the topic. So you end up having a lot more engaged people genuine conversations, not to kind of belittle TikTok and Instagram, but on TikTok and Instagram, you're kind of scrolling almost mindlessly. Whereas on Reddit, people are really there to talk about the reason you're on Reddit. There's a lot more engagement there. And the same applies for Discord. I think that it's a great, great place for kind of Generation Z to be. And I feel like you solved quite a lot of issues in social media like that. It also is quite strictly moderates. I think Reddit and Discord, they have moderation services, which eliminates the risk of fake news, which can be very, very prevalent on the likes of Instagram, TikTok and Facebook. This is so incredibly just helpful and also illuminating it. You know, I've never heard anyone really highlight this idea of how on some platforms the focus is on the person or on the individual and on other platforms, the focus is on the conversation. That's just, I feel like that's just so important. I don't follow people on Reddit. I actually don't know if you can. Like, I, I genuinely follow zero yeah. people on Reddit. I just follow the kind of the, the individual conversations just to see. Yeah. No, that totally makes sense. And Sophia, I want to come back to something that you said before and just sort of highlight it. You use the word choice when you were talking about curating your feed. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's just a really powerful concept because at the end of the day, we do have a choice in terms of who and what we follow, what we participate in, what we choose to see when we choose to take breaks. Um, so I love that you brought that up. Yeah, I think we often forget that we do have choice and we are able to actively decide not to be on our phones and not to constantly be receiving this influx of information. And it's also really good for us as well. So I think it is just about making sure that we remind ourselves that we aren't kind of owned by these little devices that we're so proud about. (laughs) And it's hard to remember sometimes, right? We have to consciously tell ourselves, wait a minute, I do have this choice. (laughs) Sometimes I may not feel like it. Yeah, Um, I appreciate that. I want to switch gears for a second. A um, question for you specifically, Jenk. In 2021, the Diana Award, named after the late Princess Diana, selected you as, quote, one of the most inspirational young people from across the UK and worldwide who has demonstrated their ability to inspire and mobilize new generations to serve their communities and create long lasting change on a global scale, end quote. First of all, congratulations on being named to the Diana Award Honor Roll. Can we just take a second to appreciate that? <laughs> Woo-hoo. Second, what did it mean to you to receive this recognition for your activism and social change work specifically? I mean, what an honor. I think what that really kind of showed me, which I, was really, really nice and what happened quite rarely before, was that the award, and it sounds kind of very conscious that it sounds slightly egotistical, but the award was given to kind of me as opposed to Thread. Which, although I am beyond like happy, whatever Thread gets an award, because I feel so proud, I feel like it's almost like a creation of mine. There's something quite nice about seeing that you made a difference, which I thought was really quite inspirational. It's like, I, I really, really, it was, it was quite touching to be fair. I was very, very happy about that. And yeah, I think at the end of the day, I think these awards are absolutely awesome. I think the best thing they do is the thing that really means a lot to me is the amount of people who then go onto the website from seeing that. Yeah. I think that once you kind of, you when you win something like the Diana Award, I think all people do it are great, but the thing I really enjoy about it is I learn about so many new projects and so many new organizations and charities and movements and people just because I research the kind of the people who win. And I really kind of like the fact that I think people would, I hope people would do the same with Thread and then ideally be informed, inspired and impacted enough to make local social positive change. And it brings about change at scale. Yeah. Like, yeah. I love that. Appreciate your sharing. On the Thread YouTube channel, and we'll share a link for the video in our notes, you shared a really powerful video about what you see in Gen Z compared to what the media sees in Gen Z. Can you share a bit about what inspired you to create the video? And can you share some of your observations about Gen Z? Look, I think what actually the history of that video, we made it ages and ages ago when we were actually first releasing Thread. 
because the vision with Dread was all about Generation Z. And we really wanted to make that a full point. And we wanted to do so by making ideally the most impactful, most inspiring. I've used those two words a lot now, I realize. <laughs> but the best video for Generation Z to always put them in the limelight and put them into a really good light to show that they can kind of make change. They can do all the kind of the good things that we're going to talk about on thread. So that was the idea behind that. I think when talking about Generation Z, it's important to know that Generation Z, more than any other generation, have been shaped by three, four main things almost. We are the first generation to grow up with smartphones and technology. We were shaped by a financial crisis. Either we lived through it or our parents very vividly did while we were alive. We have gone through a decade now of social activism more. And finally, we've been hit with a global viral pandemic. So when you kind of hear that roster, it doesn't sound too great for Generation Z. But what we quickly realize is that out of that, we've had, and consequently, we've become a very fiscally aware, very kind of entrepreneurial, super, super driven, motivated generation, which I think has kind of come out for the best, I hope. Oh my goodness. This is a perfect segue into what we see as our favorite topic to talk about, which is mental health. So given all of these things, what do you feel has been top of mind for Generation Z when it comes to their mental health? How has all of this impacted mental health? And what do you wish that people knew about Gen Z and their mental health? Look, it's really important to emphasize just how kind of Badly, mental health has kind of, or not hit Generation Z, but in the sense that Generation Z really, really does struggle. 87% of Generation Z in the US say that the school or their work hinders their mental health. And around 61% of Generation Z is, to be fair, optimistic and hopeful that their occupational stress will alleviate over their lifetime, which is always quite nice. So I think just within those two facts alone, you can see that, yes, Generation Z is kind of struggling with mental health, but also there is a lot of kind of optimism and leeway in the, for the future of Generation Z. I'm just on the cusp, I'm 25. I do consider myself a Gen Zer at heart and also I guess you can consider me a joy. I've been reading a lot of stuff lately about how Gen Z are treating their mental health at the moment. And I think it's really interesting, as Jake's just talked about, their optimism is really admirable given the amount of different factors that they have contributing to poor mental health. So not only do they have to worry about schoolwork, not only do they have to worry about the prospects of getting employment, not only do they have to worry about the climate crisis and suffer from eco-anxiety, they have all of these factors and they also have to worry about how to navigate that as a young person. So as a young person myself, when I was a teenager, I did actually struggle with mental health issues and it was really difficult being vocal about them. I think that's probably for me the most amazing thing about this generation is the ability to be so open about the suffering that they are experiencing. I think that never before has there been a time when people have been able to be so honest, so raw, so true to themselves that they're able to actually seek help. I think that's so important in this day and age is with all of these different factors contributing to poor mental health that we allow people to actually get the help that they need. Mm -hmm. I think that changes everything. Just to quickly add to what Sophia just said, there's no other generation that I can think of that's had something so deeply rooted at the core and the foundation of everything we think and do and buy and, and kind of sell and kind of everything we think about is so deeply rooted on the two things. The first thing being mental health and the second being climate change and social yeah. change or broad scale. There's no other topics, in my opinion, that you can maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think there's anything which is so foundational to the way that we operate as generation. Absolutely. Wholeheartedly agree. And, you know, I really like that you brought up the hope that we see in this generation because you spend so much time thinking about the problems. And one thing that we're focusing on at BME is the solution side of things and, and how to help. So I wanted to ask both of you, what are some of the concrete things that you see Generation Z doing differently from other generations in order to take care of their mental health? And is there anything that you feel like we can or should do differently to support them? I think that schools are really, really where it starts. And I feel like it's really, really difficult, admittedly, for schools, but I feel like there needs to be some change happening because such a large, large majority of the mental health uh, struggles that people go through either start at school or start because of school. So I feel like if schools themselves are able to make a drastic change in the way they approach mental health, in the way that they are talking about, in the way that they are solving, in the way that they are kind of helping with the students with mental health, 
then we're going to see a huge, huge change in the way that the mental health struggles develop themselves and manifest themselves as these generations Z as all young millennials for that matter move into their work lives in their kind of late twenties, early thirties now. And I feel like if we can kind of nip it in the bud almost, because Absolutely. Like schools can do a better job of noticing poor mental health, which I think is the first step, and then treating yeah. poor mental health, we're gonna see a really big improvement. And what better place to start than where all kids are required to be and spend so much time of their day and of their lives if you think about it cumulatively it's it's a great place to sort of intervene to to notice things and then to also help in cases where the responsibility may not necessarily be able to learn others to notice these things it's actually very interesting a lot of gen z in fact 80 percent of gen z responded to a survey saying that they currently use self-care as a way of tackling their mental health issues and that can kind of incorporate anything from a relaxing bath to exercise to reading a nice book spending time with loved ones it's just really nice to see that gen z is so in tune with the things that actually are able to bring them out of these moments and of course, that is not always the solution. There is therapy, there is different things that they can kind of go towards, healthcare, wellness. But yeah, self-care seems to be kind of the reigning factor for like personal growth and development. Definitely. Talk to me more, Sophia, about self-care. What do you see that Generation Z uses in terms of self-care? What types of practices do you see that people do? Well, yeah, I'll just jump in and say that most respondents kind of said that mindfulness is something that they practice to help with mental health. So 50%, in fact, of that survey said that they use mindfulness. And mindfulness, I know that when you think of it, you might think meditating, but it applies to quite a lot of different things. I personally practice yoga every single day, and it's been incredibly healing to my mental health. Again, exercise, going for long walks, being in nature. I've spoken to a lot of activists around the globe for interviews for Thread. And when I've asked them the question, how do you navigate activism without letting it overwhelm you? They always say, return to nature, go hug a tree, go lie in the grass. I know it might sound really obscene, but actually it's a really, really beneficial way to just remind yourself that it isn't as overwhelming as it can sometimes feel, you can just return to your roots and you can just remind yourself that the earth is beautiful and that sometimes that's enough. (laughs) Absolutely. I love that. And actually studies show that just five minutes in nature is enough to reduce your stress levels and boost your mood. So there's a science behind hugging a tree. Yeah, definitely. Um, I don't know if you knew this, but Canada actually just introduced a measure to offer national park passes to people's no way and anxiety so you get a year long pass to go around national parks and yeah it helps to heal you i guess that is brilliant that's awesome thank you guys so much for chatting with us today jane and sophia it was really great to hear from folks with such unique backgrounds and it's really inspiring to hear that jank you're a teen as well and you're already making such a huge impact in the world Thank you very much. I think both really enjoy speaking. I can see the grin on Sophia's face as much as, much as mine. But, uh, but yeah, thank you guys so much. We really appreciate it. This is so incredible. I have to ask one last question because we always like to end our podcast by asking our guests, what advice do each of you have for teens? I think the best piece of advice I could give would be a piece of advice around young entrepreneurship and the kind of making that kind of that change. And I feel like it's one of those things which is, and this is more so kind of around really taking the step to making a change. It's if you treat your idea like a dream today, you'll have a dream tomorrow. But if you treat your idea like a company today, you'll have a company tomorrow. Now, although the quote is talking about a company, I think it relates to anything. It relates to that shift in mindset between taking something from an idea to a reality. And it's setting out a plan, a tangible set of steps in which you're going to follow in order to really turn your idea into something tangible. That's such valuable advice, I think, for everybody to just put things down on paper, figure out what the steps are that you need to take in order to achieve some of those goals and also break them down into small steps, right? Everything doesn't have to feel like a mountain and it starts with taking that first step. I think my advice, given our conversation, would probably center around mental health and what Jenk talked about quite often, but just community, I think, My advice to any teenager that's struggling with the overwhelming everything (laughs) at the moment, uh, just to to feel 
okay asking for help. It is okay not to be okay. And to always remember that there is a community of people out there that will always be willing to listen and to never forget that because I think that it's really easy to isolate yourself in these really overwhelming anxieties sometimes. So just remember that you're not alone. That's so true. And I love that. And I'm sure that's going to resonate with a lot of folks who are listening. This has been amazing. Thank you again, both Jenk and Sophia. Until next time, this is Dr. Neha Chaudhary reminding you to keep being you. 